This is the new 2022 Jeep Grand Wagoneer, and it's the latest ultra luxury SUV with a sticker price of around $110,000 and some amazing luxury features and options that I haven't seen anywhere else. You could buy a Mercedes GLS or an Escalade or a BMW X7, or you could get this, the most luxurious and expensive Jeep ever made. And today I'm going to review it. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era. We've had some great sales recently on Cars and Bids, including this Audi RS6 Avant, which sold for $115,000, this beautiful Mercedes E63 AMG wagon, which sold for over $58,000, and this gorgeous yellow Porsche 911 Turbo, 996 Turbo, one of my favorites, brought $57,000. If you're looking to sell your cool enthusiast car from the modern era, the 1980s and up, Cars and Bids is the place to do it. And if you're looking to buy a cool car from the modern era, check out Cars and Bids with daily auctions of cool cars at carsandbids.com. Okay, so let's talk Grand Wagoneer. Basically, everybody knows the old school Jeep Wagoneer, which was made throughout the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, all the way through 1991. It was Jeep's flagship model, and it became an icon, but Jeep replaced it in 1992 with the smaller, more efficient, more modern Grand Cherokee. Well, now the Grand Wagoneer is back, and once again, it's Jeep's flagship SUV. There are actually two versions. There's the entry-level Jeep Wagoneer, which starts around $70,000, and then there's the luxury model, the Grand Wagoneer, which starts just under $90,000. They're both the same size, about 214 inches long, which makes this longer than a Cadillac Escalade and way longer than a Mercedes GLS or a BMW X7. Indeed, this this is massive, and it has the engine to match. The base level Wagoneer comes standard with a 5.7 liter V8, but in the Grand Wagoneer, you could only get a 6.4 liter V8 with about 470 horsepower. As you might guess, it's not very efficient. 13 miles per gallon in the city, 18 miles per gallon on the highway, and also it's loaded with some truly amazing luxury features, which you're barely going to believe when I show you. So today I'm going to review the Grand Wagoneer and I'll show you the quirks and features of the ultimate Jeep. First I'll take you on a thorough tour of it and then I'll get it out on the road and drive it and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the new Grand Wagoneer with some of the craziest quirks and features, and that means starting in this unreal interior. Now, before I get into this, I want to mention this is the Grand Wagoneer, meaning the luxury version of the Wagoneer, and this is the Series 3 model, which is the top trim level with a sticker price of over $110,000. So this has all the cool stuff, and that means, well, for one thing, screens. This car has eight interior screens screens, totaling over 72 inches of screen. This car has more than six feet <laughs> of interior screen. And unquestionably, the coolest of all the screens is the one over here on the passenger side. Yes, this is a screen. You can see it's darkened. You press this little button in the center console, it turns on this screen, and then the passenger has their own screen in addition to the giant center console screen and of course the screen on the driver's side. So what can the front passenger do with their little individual screen? Well, mainly they can use it for media. They can like listen to individual music here with Bluetooth headphones on, or they can watch an individual movie here, their own separate front passenger movie, or they can plug in a device to this HDMI port here in the center console, like a video game system, probably if they wanted to, and then they could play games while sitting in the front passenger seat. This stuff is not crazy revolutionary. Rear passengers have been able to do it forever, but I've never seen it in the front passenger seat before, and it gets crazier. The front passenger can also sit here and monitor the rear passenger 
passengers using this screen. There's this little camera feature that you can use to monitor your backseat passengers and see what they're doing. This can be useful if you have your whole family in the car. The driver is driving, the front passenger, the other parent, can sit here and watch the kids in back to make sure they're not getting in too much trouble. You don't have to turn around and try to see what they're doing because you can see it all on this camera. And you can zoom into individual seats to make sure if you have like a problem child that that child is being specifically watched. Better yet, this camera system is mounted in the middle of the interior in back, meaning that you can use it to look into rear-facing car seats, which is a drawback of some of these interior camera systems. They're mounted too far forward. You can't see into a rear-facing car seat. Well, you can here, and you can watch everything that's going on from the front passenger seat. You can also use this screen for navigation, as you can see here. So there's really a lot going on in here, and the driver can't see any of it. You can see right now the screen is on from the driver's seat. It's angled in a way the driver can't see it. This is probably a legal safety thing. You can't like be watching a movie while you're driving along, and so this screen has to be out of view of the driver, which it is, meaning you can sit here in the front passenger seat, watch whatever you want, and the driver won't be able to judge you. And the screen situation in this car just gets crazier. In the middle, you have this massive center infotainment screen, pretty standard stuff, although this one is unusually large. Right below that, you can see there's this little storage area where there's a lot of different ports where you can plug in devices. But if you press this little button in the center console, another screen drops into this area and covers up these ports. This is your comfort screen for climate controls and other items. Now, the problem with this screen, as you can see, it's very glitchy. It's just dropped, but it won't turn on. And I've had a lot of trouble getting this screen to try to turn on during my time with this car. It doesn't seem to always work, which is disappointing. But when it does work, this is where your climate controls are. And you can see just the fan speed, just the air temperature, just where the air comes out, all on this beautiful screen, which looks nice. Move over to the next tab, and you can see your seat controls in here, and there are many of them. You can adjust these seats basically any way you want to get super comfortable, and there really are some amazing adjustments. For instance, this little lower part of the seat will curl out forward to extend for taller drivers to provide them with leg support. And how about the fact that the headrest can adjust in four separate ways, up, down, and forward or backwards. You have a four-way adjustment headrest. I have cars, the seats don't even adjust four ways. That is pretty crazy. But I mean, next in this lower screen, you have your massage tab where you can turn on your seat massage in the front seats. Driver and passenger have massage. And you can see there are many different options for massages in this car. You can choose exactly how intense, exactly where they go and various different programs of massage for ultra luxury. And your last tab here is for your rear climate controls. You can use this to adjust, obviously, the climate controls in back, the air temperature, the fan speed, the positioning, that sort of thing. Now, I mentioned earlier this screen is glitchy. The good news is there's backup controls for everything I just showed you, including actual hard climate controls right above it. So if you don't want to use that screen to change your climate settings, you can use all of these hard buttons, which are, of course, always there, and you can do it there instead, just in case you don't trust your little glitchy screen. Now, one other thing about this lower screen that's kind of cool, you can also just turn it off. And if it's being glitchy, it still has a purpose. It can cover up this little storage cubby that I showed you behind the screen so it can hide stuff and keep it out of the way. If you want to put a phone in there and like hide it, you can do that, put the screen down, and no one will ever really know that there's like a hidden storage space behind it. And speaking of hidden storage spaces in this car, here's another fantastic quirk. In the center, you can see the center console here, this beautiful wood and aluminum piece, and on top of it, two individual armrests for driver and passenger trimmed in leather with contrast stitching. It's very beautiful. Now you lift this up, and you can see this storage area is actually a cooler. You press this button and you can turn this on and use it as a cooler to keep your drinks, your sandwich, or whatever cold while you're driving along. Here's the crazy thing though, you can also option this center console to be a lockbox that has a keypad in order to get inside. So if you want to keep something very secure in here, you have a keypad safe that you can get in your Grand Wagoneer, which is pretty cool. But anyway, next up, our next crazy quirk slash feature in this car is the interior quality. It is absolutely amazing in here. Look around. This is a beautiful interior 
with some truly beautiful materials. Fantastic stuff used everywhere, absolutely on the level of the top-end luxury SUVs from BMW, Mercedes, the Escalade. This is right up there with the very best. It is gorgeous in here. Some examples, you have gorgeous stitched leather basically everywhere. The dashboard, you can see beautiful blue leather with this copper contrast stitching all over the place. The center console, you can see more of it here, and then the steering wheel entirely finished in this blue leather and stitching. Same deal on the door panel. Every surface is covered in this stuff, except for the surfaces covered in wood, which is even more beautiful, and this is real wood. And you can see on the passenger side, Grand Wagoneer inlaid in aluminum, and it's completely flat, and it's just gorgeous to look at and to touch. Absolutely fantastic details in here. The seats are quilted leather. They look great, and they feel great, and like I showed you before, they're adjustable a zillion ways. But maybe my very favorite luxury material touch in this interior is the start-stop button. You can see here it actually has its own leather-stitched, like, casing around it. Even though they could have just stuck it on the side of the steering wheel, whatever, they put it in its own leather and stitched little area in the dashboard, which is just great attention to detail. But there is one drawback in here, and that is the stalks coming off the steering column for the turn signals and the wipers. They're cheap, crappy plastic, and they're the same ones from, like, the base model rental car Dodge Charger, and they put it in this thing, too. I don't understand why they do this. Just make a nicer one. Chrysler is now making enough luxury vehicles that they could surely justify making new stocks for them. This is something you touch often and see often, and it's the only drawback of this interior, and it's just a little disappointing they didn't go the extra mile and at least change those a little and make them classier. And by the way, since we're in the vicinity of the steering wheel, something interesting to discuss here. On the center of the steering wheel, you can see it says Grand Wagoneer, and it doesn't say Jeep. And in fact, it doesn't say Jeep anywhere on this entire vehicle. Open the door and you can see on the door sill it says Wagoneer, and on the side of the seat it says Grand Wagoneer. On the key, it doesn't say Jeep, instead it says Grand Wagoneer. In the front, there's no Jeep badge in the usual spot like on every other Jeep. Instead, Wagoneer is printed there. On the side, Grand Wagoneer going down the side of the doors, and in the back, it only says Grand Wagoneer in absolutely massive font with a little copper trim, as you can see. But again, the point is, no Jeep. Even the center caps of the wheels say Wagoneer instead of Jeep. You will not find a Jeep badge anywhere in this vehicle. I think Jeep is thinking that the Grand Wagoneer nameplate can stand up on its own, and it doesn't need to be associated with Jeep in order to project the opulent luxury image that they're going for. So there are no Jeep badges anywhere, inside and out. The only one I found is this tiny little badge below the mirror. You can see it says Jeep here. That's it. Incredibly subtle, incredibly small. Otherwise, Grand Wagoneer on every surface. And since I'm talking Grand Wagoneer badging, might as well come outside of the car to go over a few other interesting exterior quirks and features, starting with lighting. When you turn on the turn signals in this car, it doesn't just blink. Instead, up front, it does this little sweeping pattern that is very beautiful. This is becoming more common in luxury cars. Same deal in back, it doesn't just blink. Instead, it sweeps across to provide a more exciting turn signal experience for people outside the car. More notable than the turn signals, though, is the little dance that the lights do when you walk up to the car and unlock it. You can see in front, they do this whole big affair to tell you that they recognize you and they're excited to see you and yes this is your grand wagoneer that's your little front light dance same deal in back you walk up to the car in back and you can see again a light dance happens to show you that you've approached your car and to confirm your beautiful grand wagoneer is awaiting your drive and it's the same deal when you lock the Grand Wagoneer and walk away. You can see the front lights again do a little dance showing you that they're turning off and again recognizing your lock. Same deal in back. You can see the rear lights do their little dance when you lock the car and walk away. Again, this is becoming more and more common in luxury cars as a way to kind of distinguish them, make them stand out and be cool. And the Grand Wagoneer, it's a serious luxury car, so it has it too. And speaking of stuff that recognizes you as you come up to the car, let's talk running boards. You can see the Grand Wagoneer doesn't have any until you walk up and approach the door and then they deploy so that you can easily climb inside and you can step on the running boards. They're actually huge, very wide, very useful for getting in and out. You close the door and the running boards sort of sit in place for a few more seconds and then they retreat back up into the car. The benefit here is Jeep can give you huge usable running boards and not have it affect this car's off-road capabilities because when the running boards go back up, your ground clearance is preserved, whereas some cars that have running boards that are always 
always down. They would scrape on stuff if you want to off-road them. Not the case with power running boards in the Grand Wagoneer. And next up, we climb into the back of the Grand Wagoneer, the second row, where you can see that this one has two individual rear seats plus a large fixed center console back here. There are a few different seating configurations in the Grand Wagoneer, but this is the most luxurious and opulent of them. And it includes several different screens. I mentioned this car has eight total screens. I showed you a few in the front seat, but there are more in back. Most noticeable, you have screens mounted on the backs of the front seats, one on each side. These are primarily used for rear seat entertainment, of course. You can use them to watch movies or listen to music, but you don't just have to settle for movies and music that have been preloaded onto some USB stick. That's because this car has apps. It has a Netflix app built into this rear seat entertainment screen. Amazon Prime Video built in here. YouTube is built in here. HBO, all of these things, apps are available to you directly on these rear screens in this car. And of course, you can get a cellular connection for this car subscription and then use that connection to watch streaming movies while you're driving down the road. An amazing feature for kids on road trips today. Absolutely incredible. There's even a remote that comes with each of these screens and it has an individual button for Netflix. So kids don't even have to use the touchscreen and navigate over to Netflix. They just press the button on the remote and then they're there. <laughs> What a crazy luxury. And there's more in these screens. For one thing, there's an app called Are We There Yet? If the car is navigating to a destination, the app will actually let rear passengers know how close they are to arriving. So bored kids in the back seat can figure out at all times how many hours are left in this family car journey. And if you press the little car icon on the side of the screen, there's even a little image with a status bar showing how far along you are. And there's a Grand Wagoneer there, not just a generic car, but a specific Grand Wagoneer, which is a pretty cool touch. You can also use these rear entertainment screens to adjust your climate control. You have basic climate controls on here, so you don't have to settle for one of those like ugly center button panel areas behind the front center console. You can do it all with the screen. But just in case you don't want to do it with the screen, there's also a climate control screen in the center. This large screen is just for climate controls, and you can adjust your fan speed, your air temperature, all that stuff in here. You can also use this center screen to turn on your heated rear seats and your cooled rear seats. This car has ventilated rear seats, which is something you just don't see in any car, but the Grand Wagoneer has it. And of course, there's more to discuss back here. The back of the front center console, since it doesn't have climate controls, they can do other stuff with it. And what they've done is create like a mock-up of the Grand Wagoneer grill. You can see all of the vertical lines with Grand Wagoneer going across. And then the USB ports almost look like headlights. I really think that's a call back to the grill and the front end of this car. Four separate USB ports here, as you can see, two USB-A, two USB-C. There's also more power ports below all this stuff in case that's not enough power for you. And there's even more power ports in this rear center console. You pull back this rolling top and you can see two more power ports here. Jeep says there are 11 total USB ports in this car, plus a few other power ports like cigarette letter style and household. That is pretty amazing. By the way, speaking of this rear seat center console, like I said, it's fixed in place in this configuration. You got some cup holders here and you have those individual armrests just like in front. Beautiful leather with copper contrast stitching. You have wood on the top. Everything looks very nice and you can lift up the lid here and you have a big center storage area as well. One other luxury touch I want to bring to your attention on the back of the Grand Wagoneer even the grab handles are trimmed in leather and contrast stitched. This is something you grab to get out of the car or maybe you use to hang clothes when you're coming back from the dry cleaner. Well, they went to the trouble of even leathering and contrast stitching that because everything in this car had to be super ultra luxury. And it is. And next up, time to cover the third row of seats in the Grand Wagoneer. And first, I'm going to talk about access, which is very easy. To get back there, you just press this little button next to the headrest in the second row, and the rest happens automatically. The seat folds forward, you just push it up a little bit, and you can see there is a massive pathway that's now been created for very easy access to the third row. And before I get back there, I should note the second row has kept its shape, which makes it easier if you have a car seat or a car seat base in there. You don't have to fold up the seat. You can just push it forward and push it right back and not remove 
remove that stuff. But anyway, climbing into the third row, uh, very simple, probably the easiest of any three row vehicle I've ever been in. And it's surprisingly roomy in here. There's decent space in this third row, even for an adult, a lot of interior room for passengers in this car. Now let's talk third row for a second, because there are a few interesting quirks and features back here. For instance, USB ports, two of them on each side. So four more USB ports just in the third row alone. You also have dedicated climate vents in the third row and they blow like onto your body. So many third row climate vents are mounted on the ceiling or the sides and they don't really give air where you want it, but these do, which is a nice touch. You also have individual cup holders on each side of the third row back here, which is neat. And my very favorite thing, you have a power adjustable third row backrest. So you press this little switch and you can move the backrest forward or backwards automatically, which is a very luxurious feature for third row passengers. And by the way, speaking of moving the third row of seats, one cool feature on the Grand Wagoneer, these little buttons behind the second row, sort of lower near the floor, you can use these buttons to raise or lower the third row of seats from the rear doors. You don't have to go around to the back to the cargo area to lower or raise them. You can do it from here. And that is a pretty nice and convenient touch. You get in the car, you want to put your kids in the back and you realize, oops, the seats are folded. You don't have to walk all the way around. Just tap these buttons. They fold right back up. And that is pretty cool. Of course, all of this electronic power operated. You don't have to lift any latches or straps when you pay 110 grand for a grand Wagoneer. And since we're talking about seat folding for extra storage, it is time to discuss the cargo area. You tap a little button on the key fob to open the tailgate. And you can see back here, it's not actually all that large. For a vehicle this big, this isn't that much cargo space behind the third row. But that's the trade-off for having that much interior room, passenger room. They've pushed all the seats back a little bit to give you more space inside for people. And it takes the place of some of your cargo space. One other interesting drawback of the cargo area, it appears to be angled downwards. You can see it's kind of flat in the back towards the seats. And then it sort of curves off like a hill going down, which isn't really what you want because stuff might roll out, especially if you park on a steep incline. But anyway, if you want more cargo space, there's a little bit more underneath the floor here. You can stick some stuff as you can see, but if you really want more space, you'll have to put down the seats. And again, there are buttons back here. You just press these little buttons and the third row automatically folds down very easy, very simple, and it's completely out of your way. And you never have to pull on any straps or latches or whatever. It's all done automatically and electronically. And of course, the third row can go up also. Just press the button again and the seats will go all the way back up into their normal position. So you can put the third row up or down at the push of a button in the back seats. Now the Grand Wagoneer is one of these SUVs where you could also drop the second row of seats. You press this and the second row will fold forward to make even more cargo space if you need it. The drawback here is you can't put the second row back up from the cargo area. If you want to put those seats back up, you'll have to go around to the seat itself, pull on the little latch and then put the seat back in place. Not all that difficult. It's not something you'll be doing very often, but that's how it works. And next up, I want to go back to the key fob for a second because this button is incredibly interesting. If you press that, the Grand Wagoneer will lower itself. The air suspension will drop it a few inches. So you're walking up to the car with something heavy. You don't want to lift it as high or you're trying to get an elderly person into the car. You can lower it from the key fob to make it easier to get inside. That's amazing. A lot of SUVs have this feature. They'll lower for easier access, but I've never seen it on the key fob before. You can do it as you're walking up to the Grand Wagoneer. Pretty cool. And next up, we move under the hood and you can see the engine, the massive 6.4 liter V8. I think this engine is insane, mainly because this is like a high performance SRT engine in every other Chrysler vehicle that's ever had it. The Challenger, the Charger, this is like a top engine, but here it's just the normal engine, even though it has 470 horsepower. This is the standard engine in the Grand Wagoneer. Then again, I guess that makes sense because this weighs around 6,500 pounds. It's an absolute behemoth, and so it needs a big engine to power it. Now, this engine also helps this have best-in-class towing capabilities. It can tow almost 10,000 pounds, which is really impressive. The Escalade can't even crack 8,000 pounds, so this is a serious tower if that's what you're looking for. Now, the regular Wagoneer comes standard with a 5.7 liter V8, and you can get the 6.4 optional, but in the Grand Wagoneer, it's only the 6.4 V8, and the Grand Wagoneer only 
comes with all-wheel drive. You can't get a two-wheel drive one of these, and that doesn't really help fuel economy. Of course, neither does the engine. Like I said, 13 miles per gallon city, 18 miles per gallon highway. This is not a particularly efficient vehicle. Then again, it is a relatively quick vehicle. Jeep says zero to 60 with this is around six seconds, which is impressive given this car's massive size and heft, but it's a big engine, so it's not too surprising that it gets there. Now, also in this engine bay, two other items to note. One is this plaque up front that says Wagoneer and tells you where it's designed and where it's built, and it says born in America, just to emphasize its Americanness. You also have in this engine bay a lot of space. You can see there's a lot of room left over in here just in case they want to do a Hellcat version of the Grand Wagoneer. We'll see. Mercedes-Benz does have an AMG version of their full-size luxury SUV, but BMW and Cadillac haven't done performance models, so I guess we'll see what Jeeps decides to do. But it looks to me like there's enough space in here that you could put in a larger engine if you wanted to. And next up, since I'm out here, I want to talk styling. Now, obviously, this is subjective. You can have whatever opinions you want, but not that many people have seen this vehicle yet, and I'm standing right next to it, so here's my take. When they first showed it, I was really disappointed. For one thing, I thought it looked kind of goofy from most angles, a little like bulbous and weird, and I was disappointed that they didn't do more callbacks to the heritage of the old Grand Wagoneer. Now that I see it in person, I still feel that way, but less so. It's not quite as goofy and awkward looking as I thought it would be. It's not great, and there are certainly some angles where it's really not that good at all, but it isn't really that bad, certainly not as bad as I was expecting, and I think it's fine. I am disappointed, though, that there aren't more retro details calling back the old Grand Wagoneer. That vehicle has been so popular and so desirable. In recent years, people are paying $100,000 plus for nice examples. Everybody wants one of those, and they really could have capitalized on it with this. And I'm not just talking about wood paneling on the side, even just sort of the overall profile sharing that with the old one, I think it could have helped this. Overall, I would say it's decent looking, it's fine, but I don't consider it particularly beautiful. And in fact, I think it's probably the least good looking of its competition, which isn't really a great thing. And finally, I wanted to climb back inside and go over a few more basics of the interior in the front of the Grand Wagoneer. Now, I covered this stuff in more depth in my recent review of the new Jeep Grand Cherokee. So if you want to see more about this stuff, a link Link that video in the description below. But this is important stuff if you're considering one of these Grand Wagoneers and you want to see it all in one place. So starting with the infotainment system, huge screen and I think it's fantastic. Very responsive, very intuitive, very easy to use. And if you get one of these, you won't be disappointed at all with that infotainment. It's a great system, great resolution, great everything. And I've been really, really impressed with it. I'm a little less impressed with the controls to the left and right of the infotainment system. These are your heated seats, your cooled seats. They don't really work all that well. You have to tap them pretty hard hard and right on the little picture, it would be easier to just have buttons there. But that's where they are and that's how to use them. Now in the center console here, you can see the gear lever is this giant dial in the middle. Looks very nice, very beautiful. And that's how you shift between gears. To the left and right of that dial, you have two big switches. On the left, that changes between your different drive modes, which are mainly off-road modes, although there is a sport mode as well. But that's how you adjust it there. On the right, you have your air suspension control. You can move it up or down to raise or lower lower the Grand Wagoneer. You'd lower it if you want to like clear a low ceiling in a parking garage or get people in easier. You'd raise it, of course, for more ground clearance if you're off-roading, and that's how you do all that stuff. And by the way, speaking of screens, in the center screen, you can also watch the fam cam. In other words, the camera that looks at the rear seat. So you don't have to be sitting in the passenger seat looking at the passenger screen. You could also watch that from the center screen if you're a driver with no passenger, but you still want to keep an eye on your kids. Also screen-related is the gauge cluster screen in the Grand Wagoneer which is excellent. Tremendously configurable. You can make stuff big and you can make stuff small and you can pretty much prioritize whatever it is that you want. The music, the map, your off-road settings, your speedometer and tachometer, you can have it all in this gauge cluster. It just depends on exactly what you want to see, your preference. I love very configurable gauge cluster screens. Some cars don't have them. This one does. It works great and you'll find a screen that suits you, I have no doubt. Now the other screen in here I haven't yet covered, but that would be the mirror. You can see right now this rear view mirror is a mirror, but if you pull this switch, it becomes a screen. And the benefit here is you don't have to like look through three rows of seats to try to see out the back of the car. Instead, you're looking at a camera mounted in back of the car, giving you a wide angle full view of what's behind you. And that is very, very useful when you're driving along. I love mirror camera screens. I wish all new cars had them, and I'm thrilled that this one does. And by the way, speaking of mirrors, just in case you want to go old school, press on this little 
little pad on the center console and an old school mirror pops down so you can keep an eye on your kids that way. In case you don't want to bother with the fam cam or any of the other stuff in here, you can just look at them on this wide angle mirror and keep an eye always on your rear seat passengers just like mom did back in the day. And so those are the quirks and features of the new Jeep Grand Wagoneer. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Grand Wagoneer. Now there's a lot to talk about here. I want to start a little bit with market position. I drove the Grand Cherokee recently, the new Grand Cherokee, and I talked about how I'm not really sure how they're going to distinguish it from the Grand Wagoneer because the Grand Cherokee is so nice and now it has three rows. Like where does that leave room for the Grand Wagoneer? Well, I take all that back. The nicest version of the Grand Cherokee is like 70 grand. That's where the Wagoneer starts at 70 grand. And then you get up into this Grand Wagoneer and you're at like $100,000 plus. This one has like $112,000 sticker or something insane. So from a price perspective, they're differentiated, but also for size. This is way bigger than a BMW X7, than a Mercedes GLS. It's longer than a Tahoe or a Yukon or an Escalade. This is a full size SUV. It's not that much shorter than a Suburban, honestly. And so when you think about it in their structure, even though they both say grand and they both have three rows, consider this like the Ford Explorer and the Expedition or the Chevy Tahoe and the Traverse. Like these are very distinguished vehicles, the Grand Cherokee and the Grand Wagoneer. With that said, I think it's really stupid what they've done with the names. Cherokee and Grand Cherokee are two completely different vehicles. Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer are the same vehicle, just different trims. And Jeep is just confusing. And I think people are gonna be confused generally by it. But okay, past that driving experience, I gotta say, some interesting pros and cons to this car. The biggest drawback I mentioned before, personally, I think is the styling. I don't love how it looks. I think the overhangs are way too big. I think it looks a little goofy. They could have done so much better considering that they had this retro Grand Wagoneer that everybody loves to play off of. However, I will overlook that because of the way that this drives. I am very, very impressed with the driving experience in the new Grand Wagoneer. Specifically, a couple things really, really stand out. Um, but unquestionably, number one is the way that it steers and handles it feels smaller. And in fact, I didn't know how big this was until I literally looked up the length after having driven it for a couple days. I was like, it's that big? I recently drove the new Chevy Tahoe and the new Escalade. They both feel way bigger than this. Now, I don't think that this is quite as comfortable as some of my colleagues have made it out to seem. I think it's a pretty comfortable vehicle, but I don't think it's like insane luxury car level comfortable, uh, like an S-Class or something. It is a luxury car, but I don't think it's dramatically more comfortable than like a top spec Tahoe. However, it drives smaller. This drives honestly not that different from a Ford Explorer, which is like two and a half feet smaller. It feels like a smaller vehicle than it is. And that's a really, really big deal for people who are a little nervous about stepping up to this size class because they don't want to drive some lumbering thing like the Tahoe is. I mean, the steering feel in that, the way the body rolls, this isn't like that at all. This drives really small and not really small. It drives like a mid-size SUV and it's a huge SUV. And that's a big deal. If you live sort of in the city, whatever, you know, people in, in crowded cities probably won't be buying this. But if you live in a city neighborhood, you know, not big wide suburbs, this this is an appealing car. And of course, there's 50 million cameras that make it even more usable. Now, some other benefits here. Uh, the driving position is fantastic. You're sitting way up. You feel like you're above everything. You got massive mirrors. You got the cool mirror camera. You can see all over the place. The powertrain is good. 6.4 liter V8, 470 horsepower. It's good. It's got a lot of power. It's got a lot of torque, but ultimately it's a dinosaur. I understand that a lot of people buying in this segment don't care that can afford the fuel economy, but 13 miles per gallon at this point, I mean, <laughs> Like, it's just, you're just starting to not want to do that. Like, I don't care who you are. At some point, you start to feel some environmental responsibility. 13 miles per gallon just isn't where you want to be, especially in today's world where you can buy some electric vehicles like Model X that can do it without any fuel at all. This thing, you're going to be spending thousands of dollars a year in fuel. And there's really no attempt made in Grand Wagoneer to make it any more efficient at all. There's no plug-in version. Maybe that'll come. There's going to be a plug-in Grand Cherokee. There's no even mild hybrid system. The base 5.7 V8 in the regular Wagoneer has that, but the 6.4 doesn't. Um, it's just a massive hulking old school engine. I think it came out in the late 2000s and it feels it. And if you're in Texas and gas is cheap and you got a lot of space and you, you want to tow a boat, I get it and it works and it'll work for that. I also want to quickly touch on this car has active driver assist, which is a uh, Jeep's like automated driving system. It will not fully drive for you. It's not a self-driving system, but it is excellent. It uh, steers for you, brakes for you, accelerates, and it does a great job keeping you in the lane, going around highway curves. I wouldn't really use it on the street, but it does really well on highways. And I find this system to 
to be excellent to the point where I was on the highway the other day for 20 miles and didn't really do any steering, accelerating, or braking myself. I'm not sure that I would buy this above all of its rivals, Navigator X7 GLS uh, Escalade, but it would be on my short list, and honestly, I might. Like, it's right there at the very top of this segment, and I think it's a great car, and it's amazing for a first effort, a long-awaited first effort. It kind of fits with expectations, except in terms of styling and design. And so that's the 2022 Jeep Grand Wagoneer. This is one of the very best luxury SUVs on the road, but it's also one of the most expensive and one of the most inefficient. Still, if you want the most space and the most tech and the most size and the most power and luxury, this this might be the vehicle for you, but you're gonna pay for it. Anyway, now it's time to give the new Grand Wagoneer a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Grand Wagoneer is a bit odd and quite controversial. It's fine, but not really lust-inducing, like some of its rivals, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Acceleration 0-60 to 60 is 6 seconds, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Handling is surprisingly good. It handles a lot smaller than it is, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Fun factor is low. It's reasonably fast and sort of capable off-road, so it does okay, but it's not all about fun, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Cool factor is strong, though not as good as it could be if it looked a bit more appealing, and it gets a 5 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 21 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. The Grand Wagoneer has a lot of amazing tech and it gets a 9 out of 10. Comfort is fantastic. Not quite truly ultra luxury comfortable like Rolls or Bentley, but closer than you'd expect from a Jeep and it gets an 8 out of 10. Quality is excellent. We'll see about reliability, but my god, that interior is incredible and it gets an 8 out of 10. Practicality is excellent and it gets a 9 out of 10, stopping just short of a perfect score because of the gas mileage penalty. Finally, value, and this is a tough one to rate. It offers a lot of room, a lot of tech, a lot of power, but it's still 110 grand for a Jeep. All things considered, it gets 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 40 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 61 out of 100, which places it here against rivals, tying the BMW X7 for the top spot among full-size three-row luxury SUVs. I don't love how the Grand Wagoneer looks, but in every other way, it's amazing. Fantastic interior, like a Lincoln Navigator, great tech, like a Cadillac Escalade, and a smaller driving experience, like a BMW X7 or a Mercedes GLS. The Grand Wagoneer pretty much combines all the good stuff about its rivals into one vehicle with controversial styling and poor fuel economy, its only real flaws. Ah!